I was only going to speak because today is about Stacy. And I thank you for the gift of your presence. I first met Stacy sitting on one of the original boards, Mary Beth, you were there too, one of our original board meetings there at the Hollywood Historical Society. She took copious notes. She was in charge of our money. Did we trust and love her or what? She sharpened her pencil every time, but did it so perfectly, like a lady, professional, and so quietly. We went on to meet her beautiful family, her husband, her mother. Her mother's always been an amazing cook, and her husband has always been president of her fan club. Without a doubt, and I took a seat there too. The world is a little different today. Stacy isn't here. But I believe with everything I believe that she lives on in the hearts and in the minds of people who loved her and love and know her still. Our world is a little bit different because Stacy has lived. Today's basket, I know you know I'm the queen of baskets. That's what I'm doing. That's what I'm going to start to get that on my resume. Karen, is that okay with you? Oh, uh, she's really right. happy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, all right. Okay. Okay. I mean, we went for a little bit. Yes, that is the basket that we will raffle off at the end of today's presentation in honor of Stacy. And knowing Stacy as we all do with her sharp pencil and the money portion of our board in a very quiet way, I ask you and thank you for your donation in her honor. Stacy lives on in everything we do at the Hollywood Historical Society. Personally, I have to say, when we are together, her name comes up, whether it be, and I'm so grateful that you will be heard today in telling us about the history of that sportatorium, right? And the western part of the Hollywood was nothing. A couple of maybe dirt roads, but Hollywood had alleys. And I remember Stacy and I thinking that was just the neatest thing. But she researched and did a beautiful job to tell us about that sportatorium. And she, if, uh, if you love Hollywood, raise your hand because that means you love Stacy. Okay, you absolutely do. Thank you for the gift of your presence today. Um, yes, I'm going to introduce, well, I'm not going to introduce, I'm going to bring Karen up because she is the boss around here. And um, thank you again um, to Stacy's family. Love never dies. And in that circle of no beginning and no end, we are your extended family. And we continue to think about Stacy, and we talk about her all the time. Okay? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Valerie. If anyone wants to buy any more tickets for the basket, it weighed about 20 pounds. So be back to have a wheelbarrow, you can take it home. Um, thank you for attending today. We're looking forward to an exciting 2023 series. And copies are in the bags that we have up front. As you leave, take one of our bags. The new lecture series is going to be awesome. I actually have Brian Norcross coming this year to tell us about hurricanes. So we've got a real, and then in January, <coughs> yeah, he was a, a weathercaster years ago on TV. Um, and uh, in January, Sue Gillis is going to tell us about the 1947 flood. And we've got pictures of um, Orangebrook Golf Course. All that was on it was about six trees in about this much water. So that should be, you know, I'm trying to keep them fun and light, but at least teach you something about Hollywood. <clears throat> I want to thank Stacy's mom. Can you stand up, Faye? <clears throat> provided us with all that food and we really and she decorated the table and um, she's very proud of her daughter as we are and Ron I don't want to 
embarrass you, but the gentleman in the back with the gray shirt is Stacy's husband. <laughs> and they were childhood friends. I understand that he stood outside her house trying to get her attention when she was, what, in grade school? Yeah. And was chased away by the brother. Get out of here. Get out of here. But it ended up, they had a phenomenal marriage, and um, we're all going to miss her very, very much. Uh, <clears throat> we have some exciting news. I don't know if y'all follow us on Facebook, but we had a film called The Grand Lady, and it was about the Great Southern Hotel. Well, yesterday at a film festival, we got an Emmy for that movie. Oh. <laughs> Our president, Clive Taylor, was the moderator of the film. And it looks like one, two, three, four of them, five of them, Clive got his own. The director got one, the whole crew, and they're from Channel 2. You can see that film on either our, um, I can see it on Channel 2, and I believe we put it on our Hollywood Historical Society YouTube page, so you can watch the whole film. It tells you the beginning of the hotel, which is now almost 100 years old, and how it was built in 90 days, and what it turned into, a college, and God knows what it is now. So, unfortunately, we don't know what's going to happen to it. We have t-shirts promoting it. Um, we have a lot of items over there that we sell that, you know, to keep us going. And you're welcome to purchase any of them. The ladies up front will help you. <clears throat> also, our downtown walking tour, we had it, used to have it on the first Sunday of every month. Um, the city has made, or the CRA has made some changes. And we're going to try doing it the night of Art Walk, which is December 17th. It's going to be in the dark. We're going to have a lantern. Um, we're trying it out. If it doesn't work, we're going back to having it at the car show, which is the first Sunday of every month. The first Sunday of January, January 1st, I'm still going to They're doing the car show, yeah. But you're not <coughs> I believe we are. I believe we are. There's no reason not to. We start at 21st Avenue, and we go to Young Circle. It's, it's not a long walk. It's about an hour. We have a booklet that shows you, okay, this building here might be um, an, empty, <laughs> an empty lot, but we have a picture of what used to be there. So it's, it's an interesting, and it's a free tour. Donations always appreciated. Our annual luncheon is coming next year. We haven't had it because of COVID. It's going to be January 22nd. And if you're a member, you'll receive the invitation. It's going to be at Tropical Acres, which is, yes. Um, <clears throat> Stacy. Stacy and I started with the Hollywood Historical Society about 15 years ago, she was one, one, she was a member and then I became a member. Um, she loved the Historical Society and she was such an asset to us. Um, she also loved the Sportatorium, as did I. I saw Elvis there the last time he was in town. And um, <clears throat> she proudly served on our board and was a warm, generous person with a heartwarming smile. She loved helping people. She loved history. Um, she had a Bachelor of Arts degree in history, a Master's of Science in Human Resources Management, and she earned her Senior Professional in Human Resources Certification. I think our last job was she had just gotten with Walgreens, and she was in Human Relations, and she loved it. She loved helping people. Um, <clears throat> We have a picture and a poster over there that we did with pictures of Stacy and a Dade County pine tree that we have planted on the property at the Hammerstein House in her honor. And Stacy's aunt has a sign company in, Bra in Fort Lauderdale, and they made a beautiful plaque. It's on that poster right behind you if you want to see it. Uh, that's part of the Hammerstein house, like the roof of the Hammerstein house that we use. That's Dade County Pine. That was used a lot back in the day. It's, it, termites don't like it. 
So it's very good. Too bad we all our houses weren't made of that. And I think that she is watching over us and telling us, in essence, to continue our mission as we have done since 1974, collecting, maintaining, promoting, and preserving Hollywood's historic resources and landmarks, educating the public and our residents about our heritage, and passing it on to future generations. So now that I've said my piece, um, I'd like to introduce Steve Toth, who's one of our board members, who's going to present a video in honor of Stacy. And um, it's part of one that she did when I started this lecture series at the Hollywood, Hollywood Library. So, Steve, can we? It's tequila. <laughs> I haven't drank tequila since the 90s. I was not a member of the uh, Hollywood Historical Society when this um, lecture was, and it had reintroduced, reintroduced me to wanting to get involved with the Hollywood Historical Society. I went to many concerts at the Hollywood Sportatorium. I am a local musician here. I've made seven albums, and uh, uh, this is it, it. It was the first lecture I wanted to go to, and this was the first time I ever met Stacy. Uh, was at this lecture. The lecture was sort of a stretch of what Hollywood was. It was from uh, Sand Spurs to the Sportatorium, so this was a longer lecture that she had. And last year, when Karen was putting together lectures. Uh, she had asked Stacy to actually do a full lecture on the Sportatorium, and that's what we would be seeing today. Uh, Stacy was in the midst of writing a book about the Hollywood Sportatorium, uh, which is very important. Uh, even me doing my studying on trying to find a complete list of concerts at the Sportatorium, it's not listed online. I've, I have to piece together different things to actually find uh, all that information. I'm sure Stacy was working on that. Uh, I'm going to speak afterwards a little bit about uh, facts about the Hollywood Sportatorium and some things that I was related to in honor of Stacy. That's what she would be doing here today was to, to complete uh, what her lecture was a few years ago. It was 2018, I believe, or 2017, one of the two when the lecture was. Uh, and I found during her lecture that the Sportatorium was from an era that was from the early 70s to the 80s. So, so a lot of funny things that went on there. And uh, her lecture was uh, a lot of the comedy side of what happened to the Sportatorium. But the Sportatorium was like many places in the United States, which was a just a, a barn at one time without air conditioning, but eventually with air conditioning, uh, after the Woodstock concert, uh, promoters and music people had realized that hundreds of thousands of kids want to go to concerts. Uh, so um, uh, the, the Sportatorium was very unique, but it was not the only one in the United States that was just this barn. Uh, but uh, let me, we're going to have a little fun with modern technology here. Uh, so that looks like a full screen, huh? It's, it could be loud. How's it look, Adam? How do I get the bottom stuff out of there? You know? I appreciate the library so much and librarians. Yeah, for some reason. It's okay. It's not in front of the screen. Okay. We can live with it. So it doesn't look like we have volume now. Yeah, definitely not. Oh, I see. It's, I see. I saw what was up. Did you see? Yeah. yeah. So let's go back to zero to. Seventy-one. Just keep going. Keep going. Hang on. Um. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Are you ready to go to Sparta? Yeah. Let's get going, Wes. 
Let's go west till we can't go anymore. <laughs> Took a ride in Gators. All right, this is the inside of the Sportatorium in 1982, right before a Van Halen concert. See how nice and clean this <laughs> a lot more, but if you have to put a pin on the map right now, it's roughly at Pines Boulevard and 171st, so way out west, because we're roughly at what now? 19? I'm sorry, 20 cents. So just, just keep going 171. Just keep going, keep going. I have um, a nice aerial shot here. Here's an aerial shot. You're looking north in this shot. And just to kind of tie in all that we've put together so far, just um, just to um, the east here was also the uh, Hollywood Miami, I'm sorry, the Miami Hollywood Motorsports Park, where they did a lot of the drag racing. Um, get this, John Walsh, he moved to Hollywood after going to college in New York in 1965, got a job at the diplomat as a cabana boy, and would race here. I'm on the Lord's Sports Park. <laughs> Crazy time. I couldn't believe it. I was so excited when I found all that. So let me ask you just by looking at this. Does this place look like much to you? Uh, uh, large. You, should, you shouldn't judge the book by its cover, but in the case of Sportatorium, it's kind of a warning. Yes. It's kind of a warning of what's inside. It had a lot of nicknames and not cute ones like AAA, like the American Airlines Arena. Or um, National Carmel Center in Big Creek. So B and T. No, no. The triple um the sportatorium was called things like Sonatorium, Pinatorium. I like to say Sonatorium. We should publish it. Thank you. 
people have cars that are overheating. Remember, this is like 70s, 80s. These cars are not free yet. They're not efficient. Cars are overheating. People are wild. They're just getting out tailgating, too. People stop, get out tailgating. Tell them somebody would get out and walk. Right on people walk down the road. There was one story where I got out, went to like a restaurant, got a sandwich, ate it, and by the time the friend like met up with them, he was he, he like met, like it took it basically longer to like try to like I eat the sandwich or something. It's it was really, really bad. So the city's aware of this, the county and state, whoever knows the road. So what they do is they widen a part of it, right? They widen a four-mile stretch of the road from university to Flamingo. Sounds good, right? But there's four miles remaining after Flamingo. So it doesn't help a whole lot. It helps a little bit, but not a lot. So the thing is, if you've ever been to any concert or sporting event, you just know how bad traffic is. Just imagine a two-lane road like this. I mean, it's just hours. I feel like even when we went in the 80s, it was three or four hours. I mean, it was, just, it was horrible. But say it's 1976 now, like this picture, right? And let's consider, just for fun, all of the roads that we have today, all the main thoroughfares, right? What do we got? Here's what we got. So getting to this auditorium, are we taking the turnpike? Well, to pay, right? We don't want to take the turnpike. We already know we're going to be in traffic for hours and hours and hours. No, we're not taking the turnpike. Well, why don't we just go on I-75? Thank you. That's not 1986 yet. You can't do it. Sawgrass? Not there. Not there yet. 1986 is when Sawgrass comes with us. 595? Not until 1990, you can't take it. How about stairway 84? Yeah, that's there. It's interesting. So here's the thing. I mean, it doesn't go all the way here. You can take it pretty west. You can take it to US 27. You can take it that far, and if we cut over on US 27, we come in this back way that, let's face it, not a lot of people knew they could do because word of mouth was just word of mouth then. You couldn't really look it up or go on ways or whatever we do now. That's how it would leave. You're kidding, nice! Go up the other way. Very cool, very cool. So it was good for those people that figured that out. They pretty much made it. Now I can pretty much tell you how it was, but I have a video showing you. Yes. 1976 traffic. Want to see it? Yeah. Not this auditorium. Let's see how it goes. Thousands of young drivers seem perfectly willing to face hours long traffic snarls before and after the arena's opening night performance. Good natured police kept good natured young drivers from going bananas, and while the cars often slowed to a crawl, they did usually keep moving. Some of the more athletically inclined parked miles away along the shoulders of Hollywood Boulevard, while the parking area planned for the sportatorium has not yet been finished. For those who wonder when this two lane road will be widened, State Park and Transportation has not yet put it on its priority list. Those who thought they'd avoid the traffic jam by coming early for the 8 o'clock performance caused their own snarl up from 4.30 to 5.30. And who was it that inspired this display of patience and perseverance? It's a top. Two man, multi animal rock group puts out its own unique brand of hard rock, Texas style. Just in case anyone has any doubts about where they're from, they cart along a 40 ton stage and the show of the Lone Star State and several of its beastly trademarks. In addition to rattlesnakes and buzzards, a 2,500 pound buffalo named Tex rattles, with a 2,200 pound longhorn steer named Texas. What do you expect to call it that, they do? While many of these youthful rock bands and parents have never even heard of ZZ Top, they've been packing it in the stadiums around the country this summer. Often drawing more than 50,000 in their lavishly reduced performance halls. The sound system is practically loud enough to test the structural strength of the completely refurbished entertainment sports facility, now the largest in South Florida. The amount of smoke produced by the 16,000 plus audience was kept moving by a huge air conditioning system. Some sat near a fence. But the overall 
that wasn't so drastic. The scores was opening night, and Sculptory Manager Bruce Johnson says he discovered a lot of things that can easily be improved upon for future performances, including the crowd, the group's performance, and the way his longtime time arena held up under its opening night test. The fact that ZZ Top sold out this 16,000 seat performance a week in advance should prove that the Sportatorium can make a lot of money on rock concerts. It may just be they won't miss those hockey and basketball franchises as much as everyone thought. Terry Millerick, Channel 4 News. Yes, that is certainly how it was. So you're driving there, right? You get through all this crazy traffic. Kiss me. I'm sorry. My feet are old. I think lost my son from 16 in 1971 at the driver's license. And one of your regrets becomes a body of <laughs> oh, let me let me tell you that place. It's funny what it did to people. It's just one of those places that you had to you had to get to. It's like this rock mega. <laughs> Thank you for that. Stacy, <laughs> what were the years that was up to? I think I have that somewhere. I'm sorry. I don't know where right now. I will get that for you at the end if I don't mention it by then. So here's a shot of the Sportatorium from the outside, and it looks like a cold day in Florida, which is interesting. And they're lining up to see a pretty uh, big star. I think somebody here was there. Karen, how was your They're lining up here to buy tickets on um, 77. Uh, a second to last concert he had before he died. So good thing Karen went from here. Wow. I didn't know it personally. But think about that for a minute. This place that looks like it does. And Elvis is performing there. Why? It's it seats a lot of people. 16,000 people. Now, let me put this perspective for you. We also have Sunrise Musical Theater at the time, which seats 3,700. So, that, think of that jump 3,700 and Sportatorium, 16,000 people. Your Elvis, you're going to Sportatorium. No matter how disgusting it is, you're going to Sportatorium. Well, um, there were a lot of huge acts there. I saw my first concert there, Brian Adams, opening scandal, I smite. Oh my gosh, it was a great concert. Probably came more after, but you never forget your first concert. A lot of other acts performed there that were huge. This is just a sampling, just a sampling, of who performed there in the 80s. Even Matt, Neil Diamond, Ellen Charms. They were all probably there, yeah. Huge, just huge, huge packs were there. Um, I got in touch with a photographer. I don't think he's here today, Larry Singer. So Larry had some, he's a photographer that does a lot, he follows a lot of bands and takes great close up photography um, at a lot of venues. And he's local. So he has a lot of great photos from the Hollywood Sportatorium, and I said, can you know everything you have in the Hollywood Sportatorium, please? So I'd like to show you a few um, photos that were taken at Sportatorium, and also these are folks that performed there in the 80s. Here's the first one. Singer for Mario Speedwagon. And then who else was there? Is it? And another big one we had one year later was the boss. Yeah. <laughs> he was playing 
writing a very nice and quiet ballad one day. Uh, it's called Independence Day, the song Independence Day. And somebody decides to start setting off firecrackers. And the song is not about the 4th of July, it's about something a lot deeper than that. But someone starts setting off firecrackers, and Springsteen, and I have to edit this, I'm sorry, good for but he stops the show and he says, I want whoever did that to go back to the box office, get their money back, and never come back to one of my shows again. So several fans, they started pulling off this very impressive act of urinating on the stage from the crop jobs. And Springsteen makes a promise to never play the sportatorium ever again. He did. He did. He never came back to the sportatorium. So uh, it was definitely a rough place. But we got a lot of really big people. We also um, got this guy. Here in '77, and then we got. Pat Scratch came and later joined us super group Dan Yankees. And this is a shot of Ted Nugent with his daughter Sasha. Um, it's another shot taken by the photographer with uh, Bob Seeger, interestingly enough. And the photographer got this shot of Ted Nugent with his daughter and framed it. And gave it to him when he came back with his son. I just kind of I just love that touch when I see that. Um, now Ted Nugent, no stranger to controversy, he had a he was a part of a big riot at the Sportatorium, one of the few big riots at the Sportatorium. Uh, this was a really big one. Five hundred people got sent to the hospital at a Ted Nugent concert at the Sportatorium. <laughs> It's wild. And uh, this one was in 1980. There probably were some few after. Um, the band Rush, in 1981, another big, big riot because probably my favorite drummer, Neil Peart, he was watching a baseball game. He really wanted to see the end of that baseball game, so he insisted on waiting. The concert did not start on time. The fans got really upset. They started rushing the place. Uh, the police had to use tear gas, throwing the band, the band started throwing rocks, bottles, and 11 police officers got injured at that riot. So the sportatorium, again, lawless, truly lawless. <laughs> so folks, we're starting to kind of wrap down now, and I want to start my close with a, a three-minute video. It's a little bit longer, but it kind of encapsulates everything. It's, it's really well done. It was done by the Sun Sentinel. And it shows you the legacy of the auditorium. It shows you exactly where it once stood. Exactly. So enjoy this, and we'll talk a little bit about the closing. You know and I know everything happens in South Florida. And the 1970s and 80s, Hollywood Sportatorium was where it was happening. I'm Wayne Rusman for another chapter of South Florida's dubious history. Long before there was a AAA, or a bb &T, or even the Miami Arena, there was the Hollywood Sportatorium. It was built in 1969 by developer Stephen Calder of Calder Racecourse and Gulf Ocean Mile fame, and promoter Norman Johnson, who created the Miami Pop Music Festival and co owned the Miami Hollywood Motorsports Park. It occupied nearly 240 acres of land in the middle of nowhere. West Hollywood Boulevard was only two lanes back then, which created monumental traffic jams. The Sportatorium was the only venue for big entertainment events, ranging from heavyweight boxing and wrestling to rodeos and motorcycle racing. The Sportatorium was designed to be home to a professional hockey and basketball team. In fact, there were four different attempts of bringing team to South Florida. This is the jersey of the first franchise attempt, the Miami Screen Eagles. Autographed by Bernie Parra, the Philadelphia Flyers Hall of Fame goaltender that the WHA took no more from the NHL until the legitimize the league. Unfortunately, the Screaming Eagles never got off the ground, probably because the Sportatorium was unsuitable for hockey. The man failed as a sports arena that thrived as a concert hall. Bob Williams endured about two dozen concerts in a smoke filled, non air conditioned, asphalt floored sweat box, and he kept going back for more. It was good old dirty rock and roll, you know. It was broken down place out in the middle of nowhere and you can be loud as you want and we didn't have to shut down at 11 p.m. because of the noise ordinance and uh, if, the, if the band wanted to come out for a third encore they could the sportatorium was located right here 171 71 
and that's Hollywood Boulevard at the time. Now it's Pines Boulevard, and this is a Sedano supermarket. We've got a sprawling housing development to the north. At the concert hall, it had a leaky metal roof, lousy acoustics, and the stage was right about here, appropriately enough. <laughs> Acts of the day, including Elvis Presley. People stood in line for hours to get tickets. It's a good thing they did. Six months later, he would be dead. The story Terrain would die too. It closed in 1988 after the Sunrise Musical Theater at Miami Arena came along. It was torn down in 1993 to make way for more than a thousand homes and a shopping center in what was by then Pembroke Pines. Sensible, practical, but not nearly as cool. With another chapter in South Florida's dubious history, I'm Wayne Rooster for the Sun Sentinel. <laughs> So look at that, you can rarely go to the rock and you can stand right by the lovable dump. Right here. Look, you're on stage. Oh, that's amazing, I love it. So that's just it. Repeating over. Imagine what she could have done with an hour's worth about this place. Uh, I think she filled in so many facts of this place. Um, you know, I tried to... Um, a couple things of interest were that the Hollywood Sportatorium was never in Hollywood. Uh, it was unincorporated Broward County, and it became Pembroke Pines at one time. Uh, that it, its, its history did not... It seemed to be such a long history, but in reality, uh, Pirates World and uh, the Miami Marine Stadium were the two places where there were concerts before. We didn't have a basketball team or a hockey team, so there weren't uh, any uh, stadiums that were of like 10,000 seats or uh, 15,000 seats. Uh, so as they had mentioned, the, the Sun Sentinel um, um, gentleman had mentioned that um, uh, that, that Stephen Calder was involved, that had built Calder Racetrack. Uh, the, the Hollywood Motorsports Park was built first in 1966, and um, I got to see some of the drag racing there, Big Daddy Don Garlitz, and they had funny cars, which uh, Jungle Jim Lieberman and uh, Mongoose and Snake. Uh, I also... Uh, uh, so the history of the Sportatorium, they built it right afterwards, and they started in 68, and they opened it in 1969, but the original building had no air conditioning, and it was just basically a barn uh, that wasn't open air, and the first concerts they had, there was a summer concert series at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, which uh, the, she had mentioned Pink Floyd from Roger Waters, uh, I, I forget what his quote was, but they were one of the first concerts there in August at two o'clock. And, you know, I mean, maybe we had better sea breeze at the time, but uh, they were in the Everglades at this time, you know. Uh, so until the early 70s, this was, it was, it was really a rodeo arena uh, where they could have uh, multiple things happen there. Uh, and then they air conditioned it not so well. Um, but still, it was air conditioned, and as I had said earlier, before the um, video had come on, that there's no complete record of all the concerts who were there. Uh, I forget how to pull out of here to get uh, back to this. Oh, here we go. Oh. I'll, I'll get to something. I can talk while I'm doing this. Uh, uh, for instance, she had mentioned an Elton John concert, but in the list of concerts that I had seen, here's just a, uh, oops, I'm Mac, and this is Windows. Uh -huh. I'm trying. I'm, you know, I'm doing the double click thing in the. Um, so will that be every one of them? They could do that with. 
here we can open it that way. You might have to scroll down a little. Okay, yeah. So these were the earlier shows. Uh, and there's Elvis in 77. I lived at uh, the first section of Pembroke Pines. So we would be off of New Year University, about 72nd, where BCC is now. And to my recollection, Elvis Presley was the longest line of, of cars I'd ever seen past University Drive. Uh, another sort of funny story when Van Halen played there, we were at 7-Eleven and here comes a limo and it pulls into 7-Eleven and it's David Lee Roth and he gets out all by himself and just buys like a bunch of candy and Doritos and stuff like that. Uh, all goofy and, and everything. Uh, oddly enough, I had seen Van Halen there a couple times but not that time. Uh, I, here, right after the Elvis Presley show, first concert I had seen there was in... Uh, well, I guess it was 78, so this Queen show was before that. I saw Kiss in 1978. Um, but this Queen show here may have been the greatest concert that ever happened at the Hollywood Sportatorium. They were on a really great tour uh, right after News of the World. I think it was the jazz record that they were really on. Uh, but they, they were giant at the time, and they, it was really when stage shows were amazing, where they had this great light show. And um, uh, it was great. I, I love to see this one in there. But going over the list of concerts, um, uh, I saw many missing, like Parliament Funkadelic played there, and uh, ones that I had been on when I had found concert tickets. Uh, eh, there we go. Uh, I'll just go a few more years in here. <laughs> so here we go. That was the Ted Nugent concert she was talking about. Uh, was there a couple times? Blue Oyster Cult played there tons of times. Uh, this '78 Kiss concert is uh, what I went to, and then my brother went to this Aerosmith concert and uh, got busted doing donuts in the parking lot, and my mother had to go out there. Uh, and like rescue him. And after my mom had seen that place, I wasn't going to the sportatorium anymore. And my favorite band was Alice Cooper at the time. So it would have been just after this. On July 7th, on my birthday, Alice Cooper played there. And my brother screwed up me being able to see uh, Alice Cooper. But that wasn't the only thing my brother ever screwed up in my life. Uh, uh. Let's go down here. Let's see what I. This will be cool. Uh, I'm just not good at this double clicking thing. So here are some of my concert tickets that I had. I didn't collect the very early ones, but uh, this is when uh, Ronnie James Dio was in Black Sabbath and nine dollars and seventy five cents. Uh, this Deep Purple show here is the first time that I had discovered what tinnitus was. And I'm not kidding, I'm a musician and I do have ringing in my ears, but after this show, it definitely was painful. And uh, uh, I know that sounds funny, but it, it really was like true. And then I realized looking up these old tickets that part of the reason why this was, was because I saw Rush the night before. March 15th, and then I saw uh, Deep Purple the following night, so that couldn't have helped anything. Uh, now I'm kind of used to it. It just sounds like I got bees in my head, uh, and, and I, don't, I don't mean that and, uh, uh, to be happy about it, but uh, I think this is another one. Yeah, so, and this is a great one. Um, yes played a concert in the round where they had people on the floor that would turn the, the stage around while they played, and then they could rotate either way, and then there was a center stage that would rotate in the middle. Uh, they probably make machines that can do that now, uh, but, you know, hopefully they were union workers and they got paid well to do this. Uh, the amazing thing about this Eric Clapton show here is that Muddy Waters appeared and played with Eric Clapton, and it was the last public live performance that Muddy Waters had ever performed. Um, this here, I don't know if this is going to be the photo or... Uh -huh. That's going to be trouble. It's going to get loud. 
think I go back to here. Oh, there it is. Oh, I see what happened. So on the Unforgettable Fire Tour, you two had played two nights in a row there. Uh, this is, I used to take pictures at concerts. Sunrise Musical Theater was a lot easier to take pictures at because uh, the, the security wasn't so uh, uh, tight at the, at the Sportatorium. It was, it was pretty, uh, uh, pretty batons out and, you know, don't mess around when you got close to the place. I, I remember one of my friends getting uh, handcuffed to the fence there. And then my other friend's dad was a police cop and he had a key to the handcuffs, so he still ended up in the concert. Uh, but at sunrise, like you could walk in with a giant camera around your neck and the, and the old guy at sunrise would be like, that's a very nice camera you have there. Uh, I don't know how I got this camera into the U2 show, uh, but I did take some pictures there of that. Um, See if I can figure out how this is just a closer picture. Mm -hmm. That is not the closer picture. I'll get to it. I got I think I got it. You can stay here if you want though. It'll make me comfortable. <laughs> That's a, a, just the same picture, just a little closer. Um, so this place, uh, I, I think Stacy covered all her bases in, in, in this uh, 20 minutes that she packed into uh, her lecture uh, in previous years, but I know there was a lot more that, that she had discovered about this place. And we sure do uh, want to read about this some down down the line, she was writing a book. There was a publisher uh, either interested or a signed contract already. Uh, there's a great story to be had with this place. Uh, many people have great history, uh, memories of this building, uh, and uh, anything that the Hollywood Historical Society can do to help uh, with this uh, book being completed would be uh, fantastic. Uh, uh, she did such a great job on this. I'm in the wrong place again here. I'm used to using uh, tube amplifiers and, uh, you know, I, not wireless or any of that stuff. So uh, I'm a uh, Ludite, is that what it is? Ludite? I think one of the two. Uh, I think the one other thing I wanted to show was, here are some uh, concert posters that I had found online. Uh, Elton John, I didn't realize that the faces that played there, which was Rod Stewart's. Um, second band really played in the Jeff Beck group before the faces. Or the other way around. Uh, he did it in the Jeff Beck group. Uh, Fleetwood Mac, this would have been previous to Stevie Nicks. Uh, they were more of a, like a blues band at this time. Uh, this was the last year that it was open, and I, I didn't totally get to that, that the Sportatorium was opened in 1996 and closed in 1988. It really didn't even exist for more than 20 years. It took uh, 1993, they tore it down, so really only 25 years of existence. But if you talk to anyone that lived in the 70s or the 80s, the it seemed like it was there for eternity. Uh, like, for instance, they talk about the Elvis concert here. Uh, Elvis played on his first tour at the Olympia Theater in downtown, uh, downtown Miami in 1956, and my mother and my aunt had attended that concert. I think somebody else mentioned that they had to hear. Uh, so um, Rush, again, I think this was in the last year, although it doesn't list uh, the year that it was. And Kiss here, don't disregard the eBay sign in there. That's not who was opening up for Kiss on that concert. Uh, so how did I get back to where my pictures would have been? I'm really kind of finished. Uh, I, I wanted to just, you know, cover some of the bases of, uh, thanks buddy. This is one of the things I wanted to show, because the Speedway was built before, I kind of spoke about the Speedway and some of those pictures were in there already. Um, uh, we do have some pictures up here. There was some, uh, uh, an article about when Elvis played. Uh, the, the article that the Sentinel did the 
video for. They had a whole write-up in it. Uh, interesting thing on that is, uh, because I'm a local musician here, I knew the writer at the time, so it was great to see his name again in the newspaper. And then two of the photos, one from ACDC and one from Van Halen, were took uh, from a dear friend of mine who I'm playing a show with later today. Uh, so he couldn't be here because he's setting up the equipment so we can play later. Uh, so there's a little information up here that you want. Please uh, look over at uh, the pictures and everything that we have of Stacy and the Hollywood Historical Society. We definitely want to thank uh, the uh, Sterling Road Library and uh, of course I want to thank Adam personally for helping me out with everything here. Uh, I don't know, if you, Karen, do you have something else to say or no? Uh, I just wanted to thank George Garcia who was playing guitar for us but he's a flick. He's a friend of Stacy's band. So. Any questions? No, I just wanted to tell you, um, my husband knew David Lee Roth's, uh, went to school with David Lee Roth's uh, father, and we got three tickets to go see him, and I, and, uh, we, I have, it's after, we to meet him afterward at the yeah. after show. We got great seats. In three days, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my and I were probably the the uh, oldest ones there. That's okay. But actually, I have my son here, and he we have a pair of jeans still in the closet that David he bought. Wow. <laughs> so I would I love to have a picture of that backstage pass <laughs> before you go. At different levels, does anybody know what happened to the Hollywood Symphonic? that played at Broward County and they, they merged with Allendale the Sonic. Uh, <laughs> I don't, uh, and it's something that we can research at the uh, research center at the Hollywood Historical Society. Uh, and retired musicians there uh, from Broadway. Yeah, so uh, I had done a lecture, the lecture at the beginning of this year was called Hollywood Goes Hollywood, and I spoke about um, movies that were filmed in Hollywood, but then I also ventured into The Diplomat because so many people had played there, and Hemingway's, which was a jazz club that like even Lionel Hampton played there. You know, So there is a rich history of what had happened in the Jazz Festival for Hollywood, which uh, John Williams, the commissioner, put all together in WLRN at one time. Uh, so there is a rich history of, of, of this type of music stuff, and all you had to do was spark my ear, and, and I see uh, Mary Beth sitting behind you. Uh, that means that we have some work to do to find out about the uh, Hollywood uh, Symphony. Uh, and we love doing this. When we hear something like this, it's uh, uh, just uh, uh, puts energy in us down at the research center to find anything out. Uh, I would also like to say that you know, if you're not a member of the Hollywood Historical Society, we would love to have you. If you have any information that would like to be looked up, uh, at the research center, please give us a call. We're there on Tuesdays and Fridays from 10 until 2. Um, we'll try to get back to you. We're vi very busy at this time. People are very interested in the history of Hollywood, and uh, we're happy uh, that you are interested. Uh, we do have a raffle. We do have these great t-shirts of the Hollywood Beach Hotel. We are doing a t-shirt series, and the next one that we're coming up with is for uh, Molina's, uh, one of the longest running businesses in Hollywood, uh, uh, the lingerie and uh, children's wear shop, so that's coming up next. We are working on another documentary on Liberia that you're going to see soon, uh, so we, uh, we're very busy and uh, come on our walking tours. We may have a bicycle tour coming up in February. Uh, come on our bicycle tour and uh, just uh, support Hollywood. And uh, let's all have a round of applause for Stacy. Last chance for tickets if anybody wants to buy any more tickets for the 40 pound uh, basket. <laughs> <laughs> I went like for Stacy. I took all the calories out of like Stacy. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's easy it's just to ride the, read the last six, uh, last three, right? I think that's how it works. Zero, six, six. Last four would be four, zero, six, six.
Are you waving bye, Jonathan, or are you the winner? No. Okay. You're the winner? Woo! Well, I hope everybody enjoyed Steve's lecture. He's very good, and the sportatorium was really just like he said. I saw Elvis there, which was one of his last tours, and um, then I saw um, <clears throat> Kiss. I brought my son and some of his friends, and by the time I got to the car, I was giggling like an idiot, and I couldn't figure out what I was so happy about. Uh, my son said, well, it must have been the marijuana you were smelling in the sportatorium. <laughs> But I had a good time. <laughs> anyway, please come back again. January, we start all over again, and we've got a really great and you, a very, very good lecture series going. Please take one of our bags on your way out. It has a membership, a list of all the lectures, and everything that we're doing, because we're very busy and we're having a great time. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>